All right, everyone, welcome back. In today's video, we will cover a high yield psychiatry shelf and step two CK review. Um, if you remember, we've done one of these in the past. So this is the part two to that, but either of these are interchangeable. So you can watch them in whichever order you prefer. All the material overlaps pretty well. So I'll go ahead and get started with the practice question portion. So a 32 year old female presents to established care. Past medical history includes hypertension, diabetes, and schizophrenia. Over the past few days, she reports worsening symptoms of fever, stiffness, and confusion. Vital signs include a temperature of 105, blood pressure of 160 over 90, pulse of 100 per minute, and physical exam is notable for extremity rigidity and difficulty following instructions due to altered mental status. Which of these following is the most likely diagnosis? Serotonin syndrome, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, malignant hyperthermia, thyroid storm, or catatonia? I'll pause briefly while you think through this one. So we'll go ahead and go to the answer. So the answer for this one is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So key features here that were bolded were the history of schizophrenia, the timeline over the past few days, and then that classic presentation of fever, stiffness, extremity rigidity, and altered mental status. So we'll do a second part to this question with a follow-up, and then we'll talk about these answer explanations here in a few minutes. So the next part, it's the same patient, so 32-year-old female with the same presentation, she's been diagnosed with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So now the question is, which of the following is the best next step in management? A, ciproheptadine, B, haloperidol, C, propranolol, D, IV methylprednisolone, or E, administration of IV fluids. Okay, so the answer to this one is administration of IV fluids. And we'll talk about each of these treatment modalities in the subsequent explanation here. So let's go ahead and get to that. So these syndromes are highly tested because they overlap quite often. And then there's a lot of medical overlap as well with these conditions. So treatment, how they present physical exam wise and things that's very high yield to know these syndromes and how to differentiate them. So I split these into precipitator, key features and treatment. And so each one, one of these facts will help you remember and keep these separated in your head. So let's start with neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which was the answer to the previous question. So the precipitator is an antipsychotic medication. So if you remember, antipsychotic med medications are anti-dopamine agents, and dopamine is responsible for initiating movement in the basal ganglia. And so if you think of antipsychotic medications at the highest level, you think, okay, so it's blocking dopamine, so it's preventing movement. And so that's why the key feature is lead pipe rigidity. So that's the key feature. Remember, some rigidity can be found in a lot of these other conditions, but if they really say the word lead pipe or it's just extreme, then you know it's neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Another key feature or a hint is elevated creatinine kinase. And so you get that for the same exact reason. So you get so much rigidity and muscle tension that you cause muscle damage and release of intramuscular creatinine kinase. And so that's another thing that's basically secondary to the primary feature. Fever, in the, like in the previous example, can be pretty high, greater than 104 sometimes. And then remember, the key for this one is that the onset is delayed. And they may not tell you exactly how long, but it takes time for the antipsychotic medications to cause a significant enough blockade of the receptors to cause neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So there'll be a delayed onset. And so in this example, what, what would you do to treat this? So you discontinue, discontinue antipsychotics. So it's dopamine blockade, you remove that blockade, which helps their rigidity and their symptoms. And then supportive care is the highest yield thing that they'll test because um, most people are looking for a specific antidote, but a lot of times supportive care is what they're going for. So IV fluids, cooling blankets, et cetera, basically treating their primary problem, whether that's temperature, dehydration, muscle damage, et cetera. And then dantrolene is the high yield medication as well. Um, but you can also consider a dopamine agonist like brom bromocryptine, right? We just talked about that it's an antipsychotic dopamine blockade. So you can reverse that blockade faster with bromocryptine. Um, but remember dantrolene as well. That's the highest yield of the antidotes for this syndrome. But they often don't test that because many people are aware of dantrolene and they go with something more supportive like IV fluids. So next we have malignant hyperthermia. So the precipitator in this case is anesthesia agents. So any inhaled anesthetic that people are getting before a surgery. So they may not even say an anesthetic agent, they may just say shortly after surgery. 
So that history is much more classic for malignant hyperthermia. So they also get elevated temperatures, but it can be even higher than with NMS, even in the 110s. Um, tachycardia, as well as a rapid, rapid onset. So if they say an onset of rigidity, altered mental status, and high temperature within minutes, so shortly after surgery, you pick malignant hyperthermia. It's not neuroleptic malignant syndrome, even if they're on an antipsychotic where they have a history of schizophrenia. And what's the treatment? So this, it's important for rapid cooling, right? If you're in the 110s, your organs can't be sustained that high. So you need to cool them rapidly. And then again, dantrolene is the treatment for malignant hyperthermia. Remember, it's this autosomal dominant ryanidine receptor mutation. And you're basically trying to reverse this mutation that's allowing the sarcoplasmic reticulum to cause all of this uptake, which increases the temper temperature so rapidly. So the treatment, the high yield treatment for both of these syndromes is the same. So there's a lot of overlap between the first two. Then we have serotonin syndrome. So the precipitator is elevated serotonin, not shockingly. And so this often happens when there's two or more serotonergic medications. So when you see an SSRI, an SNRI, or a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, think look, they sometimes throw multiple medications in the history. And if you, and sometimes there's so many medications, you can just easily skim over it. But if you see sim symptoms that make you think serotonin syndrome, go look in the history and see if there's any reason they may possibly be getting two serotonergic medications. It usually won't be given in a question where there's one medication. The key features are autonomic dysfunction. And then the bolded ones here are related to neuromuscular excitability. So hyperreflexia and myoclonus will be the differentiators between this and malignant hyperthermia and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So if you see those two, pick this. And then the treatment, supportive things, IV fluids, you discontinue the medications. Obviously you need to remove that serotonergic effect. And then ciproheptadine is the high yield medication. That's an antidote. So ciproheptadine is an antihistamine, but if you remember, a lot of the antihistamines have overlap serotonin blockade. And that's why this is helpful in serotonin syndrome. But most people are aware of this. And so they sometimes stick with the supportive care treatments or medication discontinuation because many people are looking for ciproheptadine in the question. Next, we have catatonia. So this one is precipitated by an underlying mood disorder, but there may not be an, a specific precipitator, maybe a life stressor, but a lot of times you may not get a history of some, some new medication or new thing that's changed but this one looks distinctly different from the last few. So there's very little in terms of autonomic or physical exam changes. So you won't have the high temperature, you won't have any physical exam signs that are very specific to an underlying medical problem, but you will have psychiatric symptoms. So mutism or negativism, it almost looks like the negative symptoms of a schizophrenic patient. You can have purposeless movements. So just moving their arms in random directions. Waxy flexibility is high yield, which is where you, Sometimes you get rigidity when you move and other times the flex, they're actually overly flexible when you move their extremities. And so it's this kind of waxy positioning. And then echolalia or mimicking speech and then echopraxy or mimicking behavior as well. So if, some, if you see in a question that someone's repeating what's, what the provider is mentioning, then that's a high yield finding for catatonia as well. So the treatment for this is always first almost always is going to be benzodiazepines, specifically lorazepam. And then second line, if those don't work, is electroconvulsive therapy. So very different treatment than the last three. But remember, this will look quite a bit different than the last three. So this one's a lot easier to distinguish if you're aware of what it is. And then last year, we have thyroid storm or thyrotoxicosis. So precipitators can be so many different things, but think of stressors, systemic illness, thyroid surgery, anything that can throw the endocrine system out of its normal loop. So you'll get the key features of hyperthyroidism, right? So beta-1 stimulation causing tachycardia, you get sweating, diarrhea, you do get hyperreflexia, which can be a bit of a confusing symptom with serotonin syndrome, but look for arrhythmias, look for the classic overstimulation of the thyroid gland symptoms. And then you treat this with the four Ps. So beta blockade, potassium iodide gets absorbed in the thyroid and prevents further thyroid hormone uptake and creation. Propylthyrouracil is a thyroid anti-thyroid blocking medication and prednisone to reduce the inflammation. But if you saw this and you had multiple of these choices and an acute thyrotoxicosis, pick propranolol or a beta blocker first, because the most important thing is to block 
the autonomic and upregulation, which will cause the hemodynamic instability. So block that stuff first if you have a choice between all of those. But thyroid storm is pretty easy to differentiate from these if you're aware. Just don't get confused with the hyperreflexia. It can overlap with serotonin syndrome. So let's move on to the next question. A 24-year-old female presents to establish care. She's been seen by numerous different physicians over the past year and ended care with all of them for various reasons. She makes inappropriate sexual remarks to several staff members upon entering, which continues during the visit. She indicates she has a very close relationship with her previous physician. When she is notified that the visit will be performed with chaperone supervision, she throws her paperwork across the room and demands to leave, stating that this is ridiculous, in quotation marks. So which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? We have histrionic personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, narcissistic, schizoid, or borderline personality disorder. Okay, so the answer to this one is histrionic personality disorder. So keep in mind some hints here. We're seeing numerous different physicians. The key feature was the inappropriate sexual remarks. Another hint was that she's previously had very close relationships with past physicians. And so we'll talk about personality disorders here now. So you can split personality disorders into the different clusters and the clusters are typically where they'll get confused in your head. So we have paranoid here in cluster A is the first one. So I think it's important for personality disorders to stick with in your head the primary feature of a personality disorder because sometimes they can overlap in a way that can be confusing. But if you look at the primary feature and ask yourself which of these questions, which of these information in the question is targeting the primary feature, you'll more often than not be able to split these up. So the key feature for paranoid is just a pervasive sense of distrust and suspiciousness. So hence the word paranoid. Um, but keep in mind, this can overlap with psychotic syndromes, which we'll talk about later. And so this does not have outright psychotic features. So they may be holed up in their house with barbed wire fences and cameras, but they won't be hearing voices or um, having delusions or things like that. It'll just be a pers persistent distrust of everybody around them. Then we have schizoid, which again has the skits part in it. So it sounds like a lot of the psychotic disorders, but this one is the oid is for isolation. So the key feature is voluntary social isolation. So they prefer to be isolated from other people and limited enjoyment of social interaction. So if in a question they're interacting with someone with schizoid disorder, personality disorder, you may see that they're not really into the conversation. They have a very laid back, not into the conversation sort of personality. Schizotypal, the key feature is the eccentric appearance and atypical beliefs. So this is, this person may be characterized as quote, quote, odd, but again, not outright psychotic, should not have features of psychosis. So maybe abnormally dressed, think of abnormal colors, um, large hats, just atypical things, and then beliefs such as they can communicate with birds is a classic one, things like that, just things that are a little bit abnormal. That's schizotypal disorder. Then we have cluster B. So antisocial personality disorder. So the key feature here is violence and violation of others' rights and criminal behavior. So you may see a history of um, bullying when they were younger, animal violence, things like that. And if you remember, conduct order is diagnosed when they're less than 18 and antisocial personality disorders when they're greater than 18. So it's an overlap syndrome there. Narcissistic personality disorder, the key feature is feeling superior or feeling that they're the primary center of the universe. They seek admiration and have an excessive sense of self-importance. And then histrionic. So the classic feature is they are attention seeking. So remember the primary thing here is attention seeking. They can have sexual provocative behavior and then overestimating intimacy is a classic one. So thinking that relationships are very close when they've just met somebody. And this can sometimes be confused with borderline because there's a lot of the same kind of unstable behavior. But remember, borderline's primary feature is the unstable sense of self. Um, they may have suicidal behavior. They may have evidence of self-harm. And then a classic thing is splitting. So they may completely split one group of people into a group that they're really fond of and another group as someone that they hate for no reason at all. 
Someone who's histrionic may have some instability in their behavior, but the primary feature will be, will be their desire for attention. And the primary feature in borderline will be the unstable sense of self and their overt reaction to how people treat them. And remember, borderline can have instability that changes within minutes to seconds, and bipolar disorder is usually within a span of days. So that's another thing that can overlap with borderline disorder. Then we have cluster C disorders. So avoidant is the first of these. So you have excessive sensitivity to criticism, low sense of self-esteem and fear of rejection. And what does this lead to? Involuntary social isolation. So this is someone who's isolated because they're afraid of being rejected, not because they prefer to be that way. So that's in contrast to schizoid personality disorder. So this is someone that is pervasively afraid of rejection and does not put themselves out there. Dependent is quite the opposite. So they're afraid of being separated. They cling to the need for support and needing longstanding relationships. So this is someone that it's in the name is dependent on another person as a core tenet of their personality disorder. And the last we have obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So that's OCPD. And remember, OCPD is a personality disorder. So it, it is congruent with their internal beliefs or ego syntonic. So this is someone that is always needed to have order, control, has their papers organized in a very, very detailed way, gets very frustrated when someone does something that's out of their sort of system that they have set up. So remember, this is different than obsessive compulsive disorder, which is not a personality disorder. And so that one will have ego dystonic behavior where they're not wanting to have these beliefs, but they do regardless. And so that's the last of the cluster C disorders. So now we'll move on to some of the differential diagnosis section. So the first of these is depression. So think of some differentials that come to mind when you think of depressive disorders. Okay, we'll go to the differentials. So remember, this is not an all-inclusive list, but this is a high-yield list that, that they often like to test. So the big one is major depressive disorder. So you need to have five of the SIGI cap symptoms for at least two weeks. So they need to mention the two-week period, even though sometimes they may not. So sleep changes is the S. Interest is the I. Remember, for these SIGI cap symptoms, they are oftentimes not going to directly call them out. You'll have to read between the lines. So if they say they no longer participate in their hobbies, that's, that's interest. If they say guilt is kind of hard to create a metaphor for, energy will say, they sleep more. That's another way to say energy changes, even though that's more coincides with sleep. But if they say they're requiring more caffeine or something like that, concentration will be they don't participate as well in conversation or they don't pay attention to conversations. They won't often say appetite, but they will say weight changes. So weight changes is code for appetite, psychomotor agitation or retardation. So this is just slowing or heightening of the speech and behavior that they have. So they may be if for example, with psychomotor, psychomotor retardation, they may be slowed in their words or slowed in their behavior um, more so than normal. And then the S is suicidal ideation. So I highly recommend when you're doing these questions, count these symptoms out and count and name out the symptoms as they're describing what they're having. And so you really know for sure if there's major depressive disorder. Seasonal affective disorder is very similar, but remember, it's just a modifier so it's during seasonal changes so typically winter as people are more inside away from the sun and natural light they'll have depressive symptoms with seasonal changes persistent depressive disorder or dysthymia is like major depressive disorder but it's milder so it's usually just two other symptoms and then it lasts for a much longer period of time so two years or one year in teenagers slash adolescents so if you see a teenager who's been like this for a year, a couple of depressive symptoms, you're okay to pick dysthymia. They sometimes like to trick you on that. And so the question is, what happens if you have five SIGI cap symptoms for two years? Do you have depressive, major depressive, or do you have dysthymia? So they often like to test that major depressive disorder will override or trump persistent depressive disorder. So if someone has five depressive symptoms, the SIGI cap symptoms for two years, then they've had major depressive disorder for two years, not persistent depressive disorder. So that's a key thing to know there. Adjustment disorder can be one that overlaps with many of these disorders that they like to test. 
So it is a disproportionate response. So it's not physiologic. It occurs within three months of a stressor. So a job change, family dynamic, something like that. But it does cease within six months following the removal of a stressor. So if it's a constant stressor, you may not see it go away. But if it's a one-time thing where the stressor ends, you should see it resolve within six months. And remember, it will have depressed mood, but they will specifically be missing a large handful of these MDD SIGI CAPS criteria. So always, always count those up when you're doing these questions. Then the last few here, we have a depressive disorder due to another medical condition. So think of things that can be a depressing diagnosis or, or difficult to, to live with. So terminal diagnoses, cancer patients, or hormonal therapy where their normal hormones are being altered, which can affect their mood as well. And don't forget that substance-induced depressive disorder will, if you're on a substance in these questions, it will override any of the previous diagnoses. So you cannot have a substance and that can precipitate these symptoms and still call it major depressive disorder. So in the acute intoxication phase, it can be things like alcohol or marijuana. But remember, stimulants, when you withdraw from them, like cocaine and methamphetamine, you also cause an acute depressive syndrome kind of after those stimulants wear off. So this is a good differential for depressive disorders. And keep in mind, just count up the symptoms and count up the timeline in your head to really hammer these out because they'll often overlap very, very much. We'll move on. So think of some differentials for anxiety. And I'll pause here. Okay, we'll move on. So the first and the highest yield is generalized anxiety disorder. So remember, you have to have worry about multiple, multiple issues. So they will give you multiple things, family, work, other stressors, it will be multiple. And you have to have three of the additional symptoms for at least six months. So the high yield additional symptoms are muscle tension and irritability. If they say those, be looking out for generalized anxiety disorder. But online, you can look up, there are many other symptoms that fit in these other symptoms for generalized anxiety disorder. Illness anxiety disorder was formerly called being a hypochondriac. And so the diagnosis is persistently worried about having an illness. And then they may have none or they may have mild symptoms for at least six months. But remember, the persistent and the primary feature here is being worried about having an illness. So for example, this will be someone who has a stomach upset and be worried they have pancreatic cancer. So that's what illness anxiety disorder looks like. Contrast that with somatic symptom disorder. So the primary problem is multiple symptoms and they're distressed about these symptoms. So for example, this would be someone who's been having reflux for four to five years and believes that they have um, their symptoms are worse than they are, but they're not oftentimes going to suggest a diagnosis. That's more going to fit with illness anxiety disorder. So they're not going to say, I'm worried I have gastric cancer. They, they may just be worried about the symptoms over, overtly more than, they're, than they have. So for example, there's mild reflux for two or three months, and they maybe have so much stress about this reflux that they can't even sleep anymore. And again, for at least six months. Those last two can overlap, but remember the primary worry in illness anxiety disorder is about the illness or a diagnosis and somatic symptoms, it's about the symptoms that they're having. And then again, adjustment disorder can overlap here. We've already talked about the criteria, but again, it will not meet the full generalized anxiety disorder criteria. So remember, this one ceases within six months. The last three continue for after six months. So if you see that the stressor stopped after four months, and it resolved its adjustment disorder. If you see that it keeps persisting for more than six months and there's multiple worries, it's more something like generalized anxiety disorder. So keep the timeline right in your head. And then obsessive compulsive disorder. So again, this is the one that's a psychiatric disorder and not a personality disorder. So you need to have both obsessions and compulsions. So obsessions are intrusive thoughts. Compulsions are responding to those thoughts with a behavior. And they need to be time consuming, so an hour a day or cause significant distress. So think of somebody who lays in bed and is worried about the door being unlocked. So they get up 20 times at night to check the door. They've already seen that it's locked and they get up anyways because these thoughts are intrusive and the behavior or the compulsion is getting up and checking the door. That would be an example of obsessive compulsive disorder. And so this one is ego dystonic because they are significantly distressed. This is not a core tenet of their personality. This is something that is 
they are incongruent with and they would want to stop. So this is something you can sometimes treat with SSRIs, SNRIs, or behavioral therapy. And many of these, so generalized illness, anxiety, somatic symptom can be treated with SSRIs, SNRIs, or cognitive behavioral therapy as well. So we'll move on to the next differential here. So think of a differential for psychotic disorders. Okay, we'll move on. So this is a very long and broad differential, but they really do test these very often. So I put them all on here, even if we're not gonna go into excessive detail about each of them. We're gonna focus on how do you differentiate each of these from each other. So delusional disorder sort of stands on its own. It lasts at least one month and you have to have at least one delusion. You can have more. So what is a delusion? So delusion is just a, a false and irrational belief. So a belief that, for example, um, that there, the, for example, the parasitic one is common. So belief that there are bugs under your skin, something like that. But they will not have hallucinations. So they won't have hearing voices and other features of the psychotic syndrome that we'll talk about here soon. They also will typically not be significantly functionally impaired. So this will sometimes be someone who is at work and is telling their coworkers that they're being followed by someone, but they still go to work. They still hang out with their friends. They're not significantly functionally impaired on test questions. Whereas brief psychotic disorder, so you have one or more psychotic symptoms, but it's shorter, so it's brief. So one day to one month. And the high yield thing is this can be precipitated by stress. So if someone had an acute traumatic experience, this can often precipitate and it often spontaneously resolves. So these don't always progress to the remainder of the schizophreniform and schizophrenia. They can sometimes resolve on their own. So what about schizophreniform disorder? So this is closer to schizophrenia. It's two or more of the psychotic symptoms for between one and six months. So what are the psychotic symptoms? So we talked about delusions already. We have hallucinations, typically auditory, and disorganized speech or disorganized behavior, and then negative symptoms. So you need to have two of those and they need to be within the blue. So delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized speech, you need to have one of those. And then what about schizophrenia? So schizophrenia looks exactly like schizophreniform, but it's for greater than six months and you need to have functional impairment. So once you get to the point of schizophrenia, they're no longer attending work in a normal fa fashion without antipsychotics. You'll see functional impairment, impairment of their relationships, behavior, and things like that. And so that's a high yield for schizophrenia. So what about schizoaffective? So schizoaffective disorder is easiest to think about as it's a diagnosis of schizophrenia and another concurrent mood disorder. So most commonly bipolar or major depressive disorder. So you need to have both of these. So the high yield thing for this is the two week or greater period with psychotic symptoms and without mood symptoms. So that's the highest yield thing that they will always give you in a question if you're, if you're supposed to pick schizoaffective disorder. And why is that? You need to prove that schizophrenia and another mood disorder are two separate concurrent illnesses and that, that there's not an overlap syndrome. And then again, the mood disorder is present the majority of the time. So this is someone that they'll have a longstanding history of schizophrenia, but also a longstanding mood disorder such as bipolar or major depressive disorder. Then we have substance-induced psychotic disorder. So we talked about the stimulants before. So cocaine, the methamphetamines, or PCP in the acute intoxication syndrome. And remember, how do you tell that it's a substance? So they rapidly return to normal after the medication wears off. The symptoms only occur during substance use. And then physical exam signs will be high yield. So dilated pupils, hypertension, other signs of sympathetic stimulation. So substance-induced, if you have a substance and they're clearly telling you to pick a substance, they are probably not going to have a concurrent psychotic disorder at the same time. They will be separate things. Psychotic disorder due to another medical condition. So you can have things like dopamine agonists um, and then other neurogenitor disorders like Parkinson's or Lewy body dementia. Remember disorders and conditions and medications that affect the dopamine pathway can cause psychotic symptoms. Then you can have bipolar one disorder with psychotic features, but remember, you need to have these psychotic symptoms overlap exclusively during the mood disorder, and then they will very much focus on the dig fast criteria. So you'll, they'll focus on the symptoms of bipolar, but they'll also have some psychotic symptoms, and that's when you know it's bipolar one. 
But if you have a long-standing history of schizophrenia and bipolar one, then you're talking schizoaffective disorder. So don't get those confused. Same thing with major depressive disorder with psychotic features. So psychotic symptoms exclusively during the episodes of depression, and they will focus on the Siggy cap symptoms for two weeks, and they will focus on telling you that it's a depressive disorder. But again, if you have a two week period with psychotic symptoms and no mood symptoms, you need to pick schizoaffective. They're just trying to trick you with the overlap. So remember, a lot of these overlap very closely, but they will focus on the definitions and they will stick to those definitions because otherwise these things would overlap way too much. So we'll move on here. So we'll talk about mania differentials. Okay, so we'll move on to the differentials for mania. So bipolar one disorder. So the diagnosis needs to have at least one manic episode. So you need at least four of the dig fast symptoms for at least seven days or one week. So what are the dig fast symptoms? So distractibility, impulsivity or irresponsibility. So an example of that would be spending all of the money in a bank account. Grandiosity would be, I'm going to start a business that's going to take over the world. Flight of ideas is jumping back and forth between ideas rapidly. Agitation or increased activity. Sleeplessness, so getting three, two, three, four hours of sleep because they're working on some project. Project and then talkativeness. So those are the dig fast symptoms. So you need to have at least four of those for bipolar disorder. And then how do you diagnose mania? So mania will be severe. It will be result in hospitalization or cause marked impairment in function. So inability to go to work, inability to maintain social relationships. It will last one week and then it can have psychotic features. Not always, but it can. So if you have any of these one things, you are officially in a manic symptom, a manic phase. So for example, if they have psychotic features, you don't need to wait the seven days. They're officially having a manic, manic symptom, which means that they're having bipolar one disorder. So don't get confused if the, the timeline doesn't add up because any one of those things under mania can lead you to calling the diagnosis of mania. Differentiate that from bipolar two disorder in which you have one hypomanic disorder episode, which is four dig fast symptoms for at least four days but they need to have a major depressive disorder as well. So this is a combination of both a hypomania and a major depressive disorder. So what is hypomania? So hypomania includes less severe symptoms for four or more days and you don't have psychotic symptoms. So this will be someone who maybe goes to work. They're not having dis hallucinations. They are not functionally impaired, um, but it still looks hypomanic in the sense that there's four of those symptoms for at least four days. And then what about cyclothymia? So the cyclothymia, similar to dysthymia, in that it has to last for a longer period of time. So it's a milder syndrome for a longer period. So you fluctuate between mild hypomanic and depressive symptoms for at least two years. So remember, they may say this person um, is sometimes a kind of distractible and irritable, and other times they're depressed, but it doesn't quite fit with the five Siggy cap symptoms or the four dig fast criteria, and it lasts for a really, really long time. That would be cyclothymia. And so it doesn't meet criteria for either. So if you ever see a cyclothymia answer choice and you see that they clearly meet criteria for hypomania, mania, or major depressive disorder, you know it's not cyclothymia. We already talked about schizoaffective disorder. So again, look for two concurrent conditions, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and then look for that two week period without bipolar symptoms. And they also will have functional impairment. So this is again, different from bipolar two and different from cyclothymia. They will have functional impairment. And as always, you have substances and medication side effects. So the high yield substances are stimulants again, and you have those classic things that you see with substance induced disorders, rapid return to normal, symptoms only occurring during substance use, and you have physical exam findings that are key as well. And then remember, mania can be precipitated by prescription medications as well. So specifically SSRIs and SNRIs. So if you see a patient with a recent history of depression started on a new medication, don't get confused. They may just be telling you that the depressive medication, the antidepressive precipitated a manic episode which would be due to a side effect. So again, focus on the criteria, 
focus on knowing how to differentiate these and you don't have to memorize everything else. You can just keep the high yield bolded things to keep these separated in your mind. We'll move on here. So think of some differentials for grief reactions. We'll go ahead and start. So classically, normal grief is a normal grief response to the death of a loved one. So the features are that it comes in waves or fluctuates, and it can last for quite a bit of time, up to six to 12 months. The high yield thing is you can be preoccupied by death. So if they say they're focused on death, they're focused on being with the deceased, that is not true suicidal ideation, and that can be considered normal grief. They can actually have hallucinations of the deceased. So if someone hallucinates that their deceased family member is in the room, that is not immediately a psychotic disorder, that it can be normal. If you think that it's abnormal, look for classic signs of psychosis, and they'll overemphasize the psychosis. It won't just be hallucinations of the deceased. Persistent complex bereavement disorder is a pathologic grief response. And so how do you differentiate it? It lasts at least 12 months. And then high yield, it does cause functional impairment or clinically significant distress. So this will be someone who no longer goes to work. They no longer do their normal behaviors. They no longer participate in their normal activities. And they're having significant, significant distress beyond what you would expect of normal grief. So there's some key features there to differentiate these two. And again, they can always throw adjustment disorder, but usually it ceases within six months. And again, they don't like to test it in relation to a deceased loved one. So if you see a deceased loved one and you see adjustment disorder, it's not likely going to be the choice because it's most often gonna fit with normal grief or a pathologic grief before it's gonna fit with an adjustment disorder on an NBME exam. And what about major depressive disorder? So again, count those symptoms and count them and make sure that they're telling you that they're SIGI cap symptoms. And then high yield is they will not want to be with the loved one or be preoccupied by, by death. They will have, they could have active suicidality. They're more likely to have changes in self-esteem and they're also gonna have their symptoms less focused on the deceased loved one. So on this, in these questions, you'll classically see SIGI cap symptoms. It will give you the history of a deceased loved one, but they will not be overtly preoccupied with the loved one like they will be in grief. It will be its own self-standing disorder. So we'll go ahead and move on to the rapid review section here. So these won't be in any particular order. Some of these will be overlap and some of these will touch on medical syndromes as well as toxication, intoxication, which are all high yield things for the psychiatry shelf. So medication of choice with depressive symptoms and recent myocardial infarction. So that would be sertraline. So remember, many of the other SSRIs and SNRIs are contraindicated. SNRIs can have myocardial contraindications and other SSRIs can have side effects that would affect the heart. And so sertraline is a safe choice for depressive symptoms in a recent MI. What about a psychiatric patient started on tramadol for joint pain and they develop agitation and autonomic instability? So that is serotonin syndrome. So tramadol, remember, is one they like to test that has serotonergic effects. So if you see a psychiatric patient on tramadol, they're telling you that those are two serotonin medications and be aware of serotonin syndrome, which we talked about previously. Patient with history of insomnia develops agitation, irritability, and confusion with a new sleep medication. So this is a paradoxical reaction to benzodiazepines, specifically in the elderly, but sometimes Benzodiazepines will not overtly sedate people. It can actually cause a paradoxical reaction where they become agitated. So the exact opposite of what you would expect. A patient with refractory depression develops severe hypertension after starting a new medication. So this is a hypertensive crisis secondary to a monoamine oxidase inhibitor side effect. So remember, tyramine containing foods, other things like that can be another precipitator. So these will have blood pressures upwards of the 200s. So much higher than the syndromes we talked about in the first practice question. What about a recent psychiatric patient with the development of QTC prolongation? So this one is citalopram and escitalopram. 
Hence why this is contraindicated with a recent MI, you don't wanna give something that can prolong the QTC. So this is high yield. Both of these can prolong the QTC. And so you would be aware if they give this as a side effect and as a contraindication in a cardiac patient. Patient with difficulty concentrating, wrist drop and mucosal hyperpigmentation of oral mucosa. So this one is lead poisoning. Remember, lead poisoning can have neuropathy symptoms and can have this mucosal hyperpigmentation, which is known as lead lines on the gingiva and difficulty concentrating. History of well water exposure, bilateral neuropathy, skin thickening of the palms and soles and thin lines across the fingernails. So this one is chronic arsenic toxicity. So the skin thickening is code word for hyperkeratosis and the thin lines are code for mesolines. lines. So this takes weeks to months. So it won't be the acute arsenic toxicity with the rice water stools and acute symptoms. A patient with a euphoric feeling, teeth clenching, hyperthermia and hyponatremia. So this is MDMA use. And so MDMA can have hyponatremia due to an intrinsic ADH effect, and it can also cause hyperthermia as well. So keep those in mind. Those are high yield medical complications of using MDMA. Metal worker with pitting edema, agitation, gingival discoloration, and drooling. So this one is mercury poisoning. So remember, it looks different than lead poisoning because you can have overlap with the gingival discoloration and drooling, but you will have the agitation and irritability will be more common. And then you can have pitting edema as well due to hypoalbuminemia. So it won't quite look like lead poisoning, but it can look very, very similar. So just keep in mind the differentiators. So wrist drop will be classic for lead poisoning, difficulty concentrating, whereas irritability and drooling will be very classic for mercury poisoning. Altered mental status with globus pallidus abnormalities on imaging. So this is carbon monoxide poisoning. So remember, if you have something specifically abnormal on the globus pallidus, they can show you the image or they can tell you, think of carbon monoxide. Confusion disconjugate gaze, and a normal anion gap. So this one's a little tricky. This is actually isopropyl alcohol use. So if you know ethylene glycol and propylene glycol, those are metabolized to acids that change the anion gap. Isopropyl alcohol is metabolized, but it does not change the body's acid level. So you often get a normal anion gap and you can get a disconjugate gaze or basically look for ocular abnormalities that can differentiate those. This is less high yield, but it can be tested and keep in mind that it looks different than ethylene and propylene glycol. What about an elderly cruise ship traveler with tachycardia, constipation, and altered mental status? So this is antimuscarinic toxicity. So remember, a cruise ship traveler may have taken a scopolamine patch or another antimuscarinic, and if they're elderly, they're particularly prone to the side effects of antimuscarinics. A young patient with mood changes, racing heartbeat, weight loss. So this is hyperthyroidism. Remember the beta-1 stimulation and think of your classic, classic hyperthyroid symptoms. An AIDS patient with focal neurologic deficits, altered mental status, and focal white matter lesions. This one is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy or PML. Remember, this is caused by the JC virus, and this looks different from AIDS-related neurocognitive disorders. This is much more acute. You have focal neurologic deficits, you have focal white matter lesions, and then you have altered mental status. This is a much rapid, much more rapid change from baseline than a neurocognitive disorder. Shortly after a completion of marathon, collapse, temperature of 105, and a petechial rash. This is heat stroke. And remember, this can look like meningitis, but they'll have the history of recent, recently completing some sort of exertional activity, 
the temperature will be pretty high and you'll have end organ failure. And that's the key thing with heat stroke is you need to have some sort of end organ failure. And that's what the petechial rash is signifying here, the DIC. And so don't confuse this with meningitis. Someone who had meningitis would not be likely to have been able to complete a marathon. Keep that in your head. Recently begun taking a memory supplement with the development of supra-therapeutic INR with bleeding. So this will be ginkgo biloba. So that's a high yield memory supplement, basically worsens bleeding side effects. So think of someone who has a history of bleeding or is on an anticoagulant who starts a memory supplement and they'll be on this. What about refractory insomnia, taking a new supplement and developing severe liver injury? So this one is kava as well. So keep in mind that sometimes they may test these memory supplements and what their side effects can be. So that's the last of the high yield rapid review here. So we'll go ahead and conclude. So if you found this video helpful or you'd like videos like this in the future, be sure to drop a like and subscribe down below. Comment below with suggestions for future videos. And I hope everyone found this helpful and we'll see you in the next video.